Welcome to today's Postgres conference webinar, Will Postgres Live Forever with Bruce Mongen. We'll discuss how open source software can live for a very long time, cover the differences between proprietary and open source software cycles, and talk about increased adoption of open source and many of the ways that Postgres is innovating to continue to be relevant. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker. So Bruce Mamjan is the co-founder and a core team member of the PostgreSQL Global Development Group, which has worked on PostgreSQL since 1996. He's been with Enterprise DB since 2006 and has spoken at many international open source conferences. He's the author of PostgreSQL, Introduction and Concepts, published by Addison Wesley. And prior to his involvement with Postgres, Bruce worked as a consultant developing custom database applications for some of the world's largest law firms. As an academic, Bruce holds a master's in education, was a high school computer science teacher, and lectures internally at universities. So with that, I will hand it off. Take it away, Bruce. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Great to, great to be here with everybody. Uh, and, and great to be giving this talk. This is one of my, one of my favorites. Uh, it's, uh, really interesting topic and and kind of a thought provoking one i I'm, my goal of of this talk is that by the time it finishes you're going to see the open source world a little differently and you're going to see the closed source world a little differently too so that's my goal i, I have some interesting insights into having been in the industry I guess 30 some years now and in open source for almost 30 uh, over, over, yeah, exactly 30. Yeah. So I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of, of the, of the big proprietary players come and go. Um, and I've seen the dynamics open source kind of shift. Uh, and this talk is going to go into that. Uh, Lindsay's already given me a kind introduction. If you'd like to look at the slides for this presentation, they're right here at this website right here. Uh, so uh, feel free to look at that. There are recordings of many presentations. I think the last count, there were 58 presentations, 59, I think now, and about 84 videos. Uh, so there's a lot there. Uh, 600 plus blog entries, uh, mostly about Postgres. Uh, so uh, feel free to kind of dive in there. There's a lot of information. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk start. We're going to talk start talking about what forever is. Uh, forever is a long time, and we're going to explain that. Uh, and then we're going to look at the software life cycle. You know, a lot of us have lived through life cycles for software. Uh, we've seen them come, we've seen them go, uh, but there's a little more detail about exactly how they come and how they go, uh, and what that looks like. And and proprietary and open source have different life cycles. We'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about so open source adoption. The survey done a number of years ago, which really is, a, I think, illustrative of, of how open source adoption happens and what things drive it. Um, and finally, we'll talk about Postgres innovation, some things that drive uh, Postgres adoption, and finally talk about the community structure. So um, let's get started. Forever. Uh, that's a long, long time. Uh, so age of universe, billions of years, age of earth, billions of years, uh, age of civilization, pretty long. Uh, what's really, I think, interesting here is the digital era. Um, so civilized, you know, if civilization goes back 6,000 years, um, you know, the age of the earth is much older than that, but also the digital era uh, is only probably, you know, maybe go back to the 1940s. So you're talking about, uh, 80 years. Um, and that's not a whole lot when you consider uh, civilization. So my point is that uh, there is a lot of um, new territory we're going into here that, that we don't really understand some of the cycles. Uh, you know, if you look at at history, you know, I was a history major in college, you know, there's a sort of a cycle of how civilizations grow and so forth. And, and in a way, we're just sort of learning that cycle for, for software and particularly open source, which only has like a 30, 40 year history. Again, it's, it's a life cycle that I think is going to be interesting to talk about. Uh, talking a little bit about the history of the digital history, 
Jacquard Loom was probably early digital history, which was used, was a card used for like patterns for looms. Uh, ENIAC, I'm in Philadelphia, so that started here. Uh, so it's for its first commercial available uh, sort of uh, computer. Uh, and then we get into relational theory, 1970, with the FCOD, uh, System R, Ingress, uh, and then Postgres starting, of course, 1986 uh, and 96 when I kind of got involved. Um, not, you know, there's not a whole lot of years there, uh, but we can still, even with that short number of years, we can start to see a pattern. And that's what I'm going to be covering in this talk. So, um, software life cycle. So this computer you're seeing a picture of is the Wang 2200. Uh, this is the computer we had in high school. Uh, so not around a whole lot anymore. Um, in fact, the, 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 the life cycle of hardware is pretty short. I have a server here uh, right next to me that's running all my website and email and routing for this presentation. Um, hardware typically lasts five years, seven years. You can stretch it maybe to 15, 10 uh, but but after a certain point, it just makes no sense, and, and it, it just kind of goes away. So hardware, being a physical thing, uh, really has a very, you know, has sort of has a finite uh, life cycle. And software, because it's a malleable thing and doesn't wear out, and, and, and is in a way can be continually uh, improved, uh, has a, can potentially have a much longer life cycle. And we're going we're gonna to explore that in this section. So let's, let's, let's talk about a uh, history that is a little longer than open source. And this is proprietary software. So we're going back to sort of the seventies uh, when uh, proprietary software sort of took off uh, in terms of enterprise usage. And I've lived through this cycle myself. It's not a pretty cycle. Um, I'll, I'll actually call this a depressing slide, um, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, because the typical <clears throat> life cycle for, for proprietary is that some person has an idea. They have some sort of innovation that they want to bring to the software world. And they typically hire developers to write that software. So a company gets formed, developers are hired, first 18 months or two years, <clears throat> they're writing software like crazy, right? And they haven't really released a version yet. Finally, they release a version and they can start generating sales. Um, and you then move uh, the company from the innovation stage, which was sort of the initial creation of this new offering to the market growth stage. So at this point in the company, the entire focus has how do we grow our market larger? That might be product enhancements, that might be moving into different features that might be um, buying other companies that could be advertising. There's a whole bunch of adding new platforms. There could be a whole bunch of things that people want to do to grow their market. Okay. And this period can run, you know, for a year, two years, five years, long period of time. But at a certain point you reach what's called market saturation. And at that point, your software has kind of grown as far as it can. Either there's another competitor that you can't usurp and maybe you've got 30% market share and they've got 70 and you're kind of done. You can't really break into there. Or, or maybe you own the whole market. Maybe you're 80, 90% of the market and there's not a whole lot left to grow. And then you, so that's, then you reach the stage of market saturation. Uh, and the company realizes that. And what happens when the company realizes that? They realize that, you know, we're kind of no matter how much, no matter how much new investment we do, we're really not going to move the needle a whole lot. So once you get to market saturation, they kind of know <clears throat> no matter what they do, no matter what they invest in, they're not really going to get more money. And for proprietary software, money's kind of the name of the game, right? So all of a sudden you get into this stage four uh, and at stage four, because you've saturated the market as much you can, your primary focus is to maximize profits. All right. And minimize costs. 
because remember, you've made a lot of investment at the beginning to kind of get started. And now we're going to not do that anymore, right? Uh, we're going to basically, um, you know, at this stage, we're going to focus on just kind of maximizing our profit. So um, this is where the software kind of gets stuck. And <clears throat> it can't really grow much because there's not a whole lot of market left, right? So <clears throat> in a way, this is where the software kind of becomes stagnant. And there's a lot of software that I worked with when I, in, in the 90s, when I used to use proprietary stuff, that just isn't around anymore. And the reason is it kind of got into this mode where it was no longer being updated. They were cutting back on, on development costs. They were cutting back on support. <clears throat> they weren't pouring the profit back to the company. They just kind of coasting, all right? And eventually the software that, that is in this stage four goes into stage five. And stage five is basically maintenance mode where the company's continuing to get profits from the sale of the software and support and so forth. But no new features are being added. And there's no new innovation. And then eventually it goes end of life. And there's a lot of software I said to say, it was pretty cool. I'm thinking of some utility software, some games, right? Where they just couldn't, you know, they couldn't sell it anymore and it just kind of, they didn't make any more money and it just stopped. Uh, and you don't get any updates. It doesn't update for new operating systems. There's no fixes. There's no bug security fixes. There's no patches for new versions of libraries. And eventually the software just goes out of, becomes dead again. And that's a pretty scary life. Um, but that is the facts. At least that's what I've seen. Now, with open source software, it's actually quite a bit different. And if you've looked at a lot of the software that you've, you, you're using now, um, you know, I'm thinking of some of them like Firefox or Emacs or Apache or Postgres, right? I mean, they go back decades, right? And why do they go back decades? GCC, right? They go back a long time. PHP, um, Python, Perl. Uh, they go back a long time. Linux, right? Uh, FreeBSD. Uh, and the reason is because open source doesn't have that profit uh, maximization stage. Uh, they have stage one, which is parity with open source software at a low cost. And sometimes that's hard to get bootstrapped because you, you kind of got to do a whole lot of work to get the first version out. Uh, and then you enter a market growth stage. But the, the stage three here is basically continuous innovation or decline. There isn't a sense that you're going to sort of cut back development or maximize profit or raise the prices or whatever, because there's no money, there's no profit, nothing, right? None of that exists. Um, and in fact, you have this stage four, which sounds like a throwaway line, but in fact, it's pretty important. In stage four, the source is always available to continue. So, you know, I know Jan Vick is on this call. Uh, and he was actually one of the earlier users of Postgres. In fact, before me, uh, he started in 94, started in 96. But this software uh, basically had been around from Berkeley starting in 1986, and it stopped being used in, in the kind of early 90s. Only a few people were using it, right? But the software is available. And a group of us in 86, Jan being one of them, <clears throat> were able to get together and actually take the code, reinvigorate it, get some features in there, port it to new operating systems, add performance and so forth, okay, and reinvigorate the software. That's something that can only happen in open source because in proprietary, whoever stops, whoever owns the code, when they stop making money, they are done. There's no easy way for somebody to come in and says, I know you're not making money anymore, but I would like to take that code and use it in some other way and improve it because it, it just doesn't come. You just don't have that option because the source is closed, right? So that fourth stage of innovation, of, of continue availability, it, although it sounds kind of like a, who's going to really bring old code to life, they do it all the time. GCC, another example, I don't know if you know the history of GCC. GCC goes back to the 80s. I remember using it in the early 90s. Um, but there was actually another fork, there's a fork of GCC that had more features, 
and and it became so good that everyone wanted to use that instead of GCC and the GCC was declining. And then the GCC people said, okay, let's take this new code, which is more innovative as a compiler, and we're gonna move it and we're gonna call that GCC, right? So somebody forked GCC, made it better. GCC people started to realize that they were declining, stage three decline, and they basically brought the new fork in and made it uh, the new GCC, right? And that happens a lot. So uh, it's, it's this ability for software, open source software to continue to live is tremendously interesting. And uh, it actually does relate to Postgres in a, in a powerful way. Now, now this, this story is like hard to believe, but I'm gonna explain it to you. Uh, this is the most odd open source story I've ever seen. Uh, and the only reason I know about it is my son, Matthew, was a big user of Falcon 4, uh, which was an, it is an F-16 uh, simulator. And uh, it came out in the early 80s. Matthew used to use it, I want to say, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and I, well, I take that back. Now, he used it. Uh, he used it in, I think, the late 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 1984, Spectrum Holobyte, which was a computer game company, uh, begins the development of Falcon. So they, they're, in, they're a proprietary company. They're going to develop open source. They're going to develop closed source proprietary game called Falcon. Okay. Uh, I don't understand why, uh, you know, they, they released a couple versions. And then in 1998, they released Falcon 4, okay, which is kind of their final, their final version. They've gone, I guess, from 1984 to 98, they fell one to three. And Falcon 4 was considered to be one of the premier flight simulators uh, and still is in some ways, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, in 1999, uh, Microprose, which is the new Spectrum Holloway company, ends development of Falcon, okay? So, you're thinking, okay, this, this proprietary game is at stage six, right? You're, it's end of life. I think they, I think in 99, I think they were still selling it, but they weren't, it was in stage five. So it, they weren't enhancing it anymore. Uh, it became just legacy and they're just gonna like sell it, but they're not gonna make any improvements in <clears throat> However, in 2000, somebody leaks the source code to, um, to this game on the internet. And I think it was only leaked for a couple, maybe 20 hours. It wasn't a long time. Uh, I don't remember the exact, it wasn't a long time, but it was 20 hours, 20 days. It was pretty, pretty small period of time. Uh, but for that, during that period, somebody grabs a copy of the source code. And a open source community develops around this leaked game. And the group is called Benchmark Sims or BMS. You can look them up. They have a website still. Um, and they release community modifications to the game. So you have to own the game and all of the image files. But what they'll do is they'll, they'll put new features into it. Okay, so you have to install the game from the CD. And then you have to take the benchmark sim modifications, you lay them over the, uh, on top of the, of the installed proprietary game, and then you play it, okay? And that reads new life into Falcon 4. So people start buying Falcon 4, not to, not to run it stock, but they buy it to run the benchmark sim community modifications on top of it. 2005, a company called Lead Pursuit buys the, spec, the rights to Falcon 4, proprietary company, okay? And they release something called Allied Force, which is a version of Falcon 4, which includes the BMS or the Benchmark Sims modifications on top of it. So it's like a Falcon 4 with the community mod, open source community mods on top of it. That's a new proprietary product, okay? Fast forward to 2015, people are having trouble buying the original Falcon 4. Uh, 
because you need it still to lay all this mod stuff on top of it. And Benchmark Sims continues making improvements even after 2.5. So 2015, GOG.com, I don't know a whole lot about, but they republish Falcon 4. They get the rights, I guess, from Lead Pursuit. And they republish Falcon 4. So people can play Falcon 4 on top of the lead, on top of the, with the, with the things on it. And then also in 2015, BMS, and this is a little, you know, they haven't, I don't know if they have a newer version. BMS is continuing to develop and they release version 4.33, um, which are now plus minor releases, which go on top of Falcon 4. So if you have a game started proprietary, source code gets leaks, becomes open source mods, performs proprietary again, okay? Then the, they republish the proprietary, and then there's a new open source thing that, continue, that continues to make it. So this is the weirdest open source case I've ever seen, where a piece of software basically flips back and forth between open source and proprietary. But it gives you an example. When that source code was leaked, 2000 there was enough people cared about this game to make it, to keep it going. And back down here at the corner, I have a link to the wiki page. If you want more information, very, very interesting uh, story about it. In some conferences I'm at, uh, I'll mention Falcon 4, and there'll be a couple of people in the audience who will be like, wow, he met, you know, they'll, they'll be all excited because they still use it or they're still, they're still excited about this product from 1984. So it's really, really interesting story. Uh, and I think it illustrates the, the concept we were talking about. I know I've been kind of negative on, on proprietary, but I want to just give you a visual of exactly how proprietary works. Um, in proprietary, you've got this area on the left, which is where all of the creation happens, okay? And then you've got this area on the right where all users, where all the consumption happens, so they've got to separate them. And the interaction is effectively very rigid. So you've got the concept of design meetings and working in isolation and project meetings and testing, which happens all in the on the left hand side. And then only a release brings it to the to the user community, which can't really do anything about modifying. All they can do is basically complain, go back to sales, make sales fix it, or have product development fix it, or support fix it. And then it has to go through this very so if you've ever submitted a bug report and it takes like a year or 18 months to fix it. This is why it's this very slow process. With open source, the difference is that everyone's involved because it's open, every stage people are involved. They're involved in the proposal features, the patch review, <laughs> the testing, the beta testing, the releases. All this, all this happens simultaneously. You don't have kind of two teams, one's creator, one's consumer. They're kind of merged together. And this is another reason that you see so much dynamism, so much creativity coming out of open sources is because of this flow, completely different than the proprietary flow that I'm showing here, okay? Uh, so again, I, I think this is illustrative of sort of why the life of proprietary is just so different than open source and why open source is sort of becoming the de facto standard in so many markets. I mean, I remember open source, you know, when I used to do it, in the 90s, nobody knew what it was. They don't, you know, a lot of people still don't even know what I do, right? Um, it's a very, you know, it's still in some ways a niche process, but um, it has grown so much since then. Uh, and it is, it is just so powerful now. And it's really this dynamism, I think, that, that causes that. Uh, when I started out with, with Postgres and, and Jan and many others, uh, we started out kind of down here uh, where we weren't as, you fe we didn't have as many features as closed source. We didn't have the kind of performance, we didn't have the kind of reliability, but what was really cool is that our growth, uh, our growth angle was much higher than closed source. So we probably passed closed source like years ago now. Um, when I wrote this slide, probably 15 years ago, we were kind of just crossing maybe, um, and maybe a little below. Uh, but now we're, you know, it, it's, it's taken off tremendously. So the interesting part, it doesn't matter how far you are below closed source. If you're, if your angle's steeper, you're eventually going to cross it. Uh, and that's what we, we actually are seeing here. Uh, you might think I'm making this all up, but I'm just like, ah, oh, you know, he's just, he's just, you know, he's just drinking too much or something. Uh, but, but I can give you pretty good examples here. Um, Linux, I think is a great example. So when I was, um, 
when I used to work as a, uh, a consultant in the, in the 90s, I know Lindsay mentioned that, uh, the, big, the big operating systems uh, for enterprises were HPUX, AIX, and Solaris. Okay, that was your standard operating system. Uh, but, you know, I don't think anybody deploys brand new on any of these anymore, right? Pretty much all of its line, Linux or FreeBSD, uh, and, and its derivatives like Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, uh, because Linux innovative, innovated way beyond where they were. They just, they could never keep up. And in fact, Solaris is end of life, even by Oracle standard, right? They just, they just said, we're not gonna develop it anymore. Um, whereas the idea that, that Solaris wouldn't be around and, you know, would be like, but like, that's just the gold standard. That was the gold standard in the nineties. Uh, so I'm bringing this up as an example of how markets shift <clears throat> over time. It's slow, but it certainly happens. Um, another example is uh, Postgres, right? So when I was in the nineties, we used, I used to use, uh, Informix and Ingress were the two I was pretty much most familiar with. Uh, and, and of course, the other ones were around still. Um, but if I look at these six here, how many of them are still innovating? Wow. Well, I would say none of them, right? Um, how many of them are sort of at stage three where they're profit maximized? Uh, I would say, mm, may, I'm not sure any of them. Um, you know, how much, maybe Oracle? Um, how many of them are in maintenance mode? Uh, well, probably all the bottom three are certainly in maintenance mode, Sybase Informix Ingress. Um, in fact, I don't even know if Ingress is still being developed. Uh, Informix, I think, is in maintenance mode. Sybase, um, I think it's in maintenance mode. DB2 is certainly not, I think that's in maintenance mode too, or it's pretty close to it. MSSQL, yeah, they're, they're still kind of kicking around stuff. Oracle's trying to kick around stuff, um, but they're not innovating anywhere the near in the, at the same rate that Postgres is, because again, that curve is just you know so high for open source. They can't because they because that whole that whole process, that whole flow chart I showed you, just makes it incredibly difficult for them to bring ideas from their community and innovate and get ideas out and 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 work them into viable solutions. It's just too hard. Uh, from in a proprietary environment. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a great example, right? You know, you would think in the 90s, you would have thought these were the gold standards, but now they're kind of like, you know, I, I kind of tell, I kind of joke to people like, you know, imagine I'm a startup and I said, I'm going to, I'm a startup and I'm going to, I'm going to build my solution on Oracle, right? Like, like, what's the matter with you, right? Like, who does that? I'm, I might be somebody who doesn't, but I, I can't imagine why somebody would do that. And, and if nobody's building new solutions on your technology, then effectively you're a legacy, right? Whether you're in stage four, stage five, uh, stage six, whatever, um, you're, you're at that legacy stage where the only reason you're around is because people either know how to use your software or they've already got installed base. Uh, but they're not choosing it for performance. They're not choosing it for flexibility. They're not choosing it for innovation. Um, they, they just, they're just, though you don't have those things. Um, and that's because that proprietary life cycle kind of forces that behavior on proprietary companies. Postgres, because it's open source, develops in so many different ways. So the slide's actually from a while ago, but effectively the concept of that typically in a closed source company, you have one focus for each release. For Postgres, we're, we're, we're improving all over the place. Deployment, ease of use, high enterprise, new workloads, big data, cloud. We're doing this. Every release has improvements in all these areas. Because we don't have a centralized hierarchy of how it works, everything is kind of happening at the same time, which I think is really exciting. So when does software die? Now we're kind of finishing up this section. Proprietary software dies when the owner of the source code can no longer profit from it. That's just the facts. Um, uh, it decline, and, but, but, but also it goes into decline long before the death because of profit maximization. And uh, you know, a lot of software probably could have gone for a lot longer, but because the, the people who own the code when you're that profit maximization mode, they kind of set the clock on how long that software is going to remain. Open source can't die because it, it doesn't have a profit maximization. 
Uh, it remains active as long as people use it. Uh, it can always be resurrected if it's useful. And, you know, Postgres is, as I said before, was given new life in 1996. Um, so in summary, uh, because software is really the embodiment of ideas uh, and not a physical entity, ideas don't die as long as they're shared and ideas are shared as long as they're useful. Uh, so I think of, you know, I've sent four kids to college, three of them through college. I got one going, finishing college in her third year. And, um, you know, she's studying writers from the Greek writers, right? The philosophers. Why are they still studying them? Because they're great ideas, right? And those ideas are continuing to share because they're useful, right? So if you have ideas that are useful, particularly in software, and people get excited about those ideas, um, that your software continues to live, particularly if it's open source. Um, and Postgres, I think, will continue to live as long as it continues to be useful. And it's in a trajectory where it's continued to be more useful to more people. So um, this section, I just wanna talk a little bit about a survey that was done about open source and adoption. Uh, this was done by Black Duck Software, uh, and it was done in, 2000, in 2016. So it's not super new, um, but what this quote and some of the future slides talk about is the trajectory of open source has grown so much more than anyone would have predicted, right? That, that there's so many tasks now uh, that are accelerating the market because open source is around, um, that, you know, open source is the way applications develop today. And again, this is from five years ago. It's even more true today. So I, I love this slide because this was again, part of the survey they did. Um, what's really interesting is that when you ask people, why did you choose open source? Um, they typically chose open source because of cost. Right. So that was the that was what got them into the door. If you're familiar with, you know, a supermarket that sells a chicken for four dollars. Right. Um, that gets people in the door and then they buy other things when they're there. And eventually, the, you know, the company makes the, the supermarket makes money. So that's not really the way open source works, but that's kind of the hook that gets enterprises excited about open source is the cost reduction. OK, but what's really interesting is when you ask the people two years later, now that you've chosen open source, what advantages do you find? Cost ends up being at number five. So they, they went into open source for the cost, but once they got used to open source, they started to realize that there were many, many more advantages to open source than just cost. So the number one advantage was competitive features and that big word, innovation. We talked about that earlier. The concept that innovation can happen much more efficiently in open source than it can in proprietary because proprietary is focused on profit and innovation and profit often don't go together, right? Um, because you're, you're protecting your markets, you're worried about impact on sales. There's a whole bunch of things that really, and, and the whole way things are collaborate all those things work against innovation. All those things in open source, it, it, the whole structure of open source works toward innovation. So competitive features innovation, number one reason people like open source after two years. Freedom from vendor lock-in, the ability to deploy anywhere, the ability not to have to get a license. Quality of solutions, right? Reliability, um, polish of the features, um, is incredibly useful for open source. Ability to customize and fix. This is starts to get a little more into the open source aspect, but the ability to have it be flexible. And finally, cost. Um, and then speed of application development, reduced development costs, interoperability, breadth of solutions, all nine reasons to use open source. But it's not just cost. Cost may get people interested, but effectively growth happens. You know, we have Postgres conferences typically without COVID all around the world. I have a, co a conference I'm going to in Vienna in September. Um, you know, people don't have conferences because they save money, right? They have conferences because they love the software. They love what they're able to do with it. They love the innovation. They love what they, how it enables them to be more productive and uh, more creative. And that's why people have events. And that's why there's typically so many Postgres events around the world um, is because that innovation is 
really excites people. Uh, another quotation basically talking about open source sort of taking over the operating system, cloud, big data, internet of things, mobile uh, sort of you know, uh, ecosystem, and then kind of growing farther into, into other areas. So in, in 2016, um, the, the big areas um, of growth for open source were operating systems, database, and development tools. Database wasn't there before. So database, I think in the last five years, certainly has seen a huge growth in terms of how people are excited about the open source database market, particularly. Um, and of course, you see so many offerings in so many niche areas. Uh, Postgres is more of a, a mainstream object relational kind of a solution, but there's certainly a huge number of non-relational offerings out there as well in the database space that are open source. Although, as, as I kind of, uh, you know, I can allude to, there's a bunch of cases where open source is, is, is receding. Uh, I'm thinking of Elasticsearch, I'm thinking of Mongo, I'm thinking of some of the other, and I've had some blog entries about this where, where, where some of the original company backed open source are sort of moving to a profit motive. Uh, and you see it mostly, you don't see it with pure open source like Postgres, but you see it with, with companies that company controlled open source, like, you know, MySQL or ReadDB or, or Mongo or, or Elastic, where um, that company is funding all the development and then they kind of get a market and they say, hey, if we change the license, we'll get more money. Um, and that's, you, you, you're, that's where the, company, the software kind of starts to go into a decline um, eventually, you know, because, because again, that profit motive starts to go in and, you know, okay, now we've maximized the market. Let's increase the prices and change the license and, you know, start to get more money um, and maybe not invest as much anymore. Uh, this slide, I think if you're, if you're the type of person who is uh, trying to promote open source within your enterprise, um, there's probably for at least databases, there's three communities that care about open source and, 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 and sort of are stakeholders here. Uh, one is managers, one's developers, one's administrators. And what I've highlighted here at the bottom is different features of open source attract different people, uh, different groups. So vendor lock-in, very important for managers. Innovation, very important developers. Quality, um, very important for administrators. Again, different aspects of uh, benefits of open source are, diff are attractive to different audiences. So let's talk about Postgres. I'm not going to go into huge detail. This is not a Postgres specific talk. I want to kind of go over some of the reasons that Postgres innovation has been so powerful in the past since for the what, 25 years I've been involved. Um, this is actually a picture of Joe Selko, who's a very famous author about SQL with, with Slonik, our, our, our mascot. I think this was in, um, this was in uh, Vienna, I think, yeah. Um, so relational technology originally um, designed in the 70s, uh, but still around uh, by EF Cod. Uh, and, and of course, uh, in 86, when Postgres was started, it was sort of it was sort of be the next generation of relational system. In fact, it's called Postgres because it's post ingress. It's sort of post relational. And it adds things like custom data types and special indexing methods and special server side languages. Um, and that innovation in 86 was way before its time. You know, it was it was actually frustrating to have all this innovation when I started in 96. We just wanted a relational system. Uh, but ultimately that innovation uh, ended up being a huge driver for Postgres as we started to get the relational pieces polished and we could then start to work on the object relational aspects of it. The Postgres ability to flexibly handle new workloads really took off. And that's a lot of the reason that Postgres is so popular today. So this is the sort of system tables that Michael Stonebreaker kind of originally designed. Uh, but the interesting part here is that you've got system tables for things you wouldn't normally have. System tables for data types, system tables for indexing, system tables for stored procedure languages, system tables to add aggregates to the system. All this flexibility originally designed in 1986 kind of lay dormant for 15 years or so until Postgres became a relational powerhouse 
And then everyone wanted to use it for new workloads on top of relational system. And we, or, and then the structure, that whole infrastructure was already there. Jan Vick on this, on this call did a lot with the server side languages and added a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, so, you know, he was really responsible for a lot of that and innovation in the server side and, and that server side language is, is hugely important in how people use Postgres and one of the one of our great innovators. So it's sort of like we inherited in, in 96, this bedrock of, of innovation that we just kind of carried along for a bunch of years until we were able to leverage it with a whole bunch of new features and new uh, capabilities that makes Postgres the, the, popular, um, the popular system it is today. Okay. Um, one of the, one of the key aspects of Postgres is the extension system. So the ability uh, to extend Postgres here, uh, we're actually typing create extension uh, and we're adding uh, eight new data types. So these data types relate to uh, UPC symbols, book numbers, music numbers, magazine numbers. Um, and if you try type create extension ISN, you're basically adding brand new, um, you know, brand new data types to the system. Okay. There we go. Um, I mentioned server-side languages. Uh, Jan is responsible for a couple of these. Uh, we support all of these server-side languages. So this is part of that extendability that you can just add languages to Postgres. Just, you know, you just plug them in. Uh, not all of these languages are installed. In fact, the only ones we, I think we install by default are the uh, SPI, and the PLP GSQL um, and the SQL one, which is actually not listed here because it's not kind of a language. Um, but the other ones are all available as additions to the database. And again, I have a slide deck here at the bottom of the URL uh, if you're interested in more, in more information on that. Indexing types, another area. This area, really, I want to give uh, credit to the Russian developers who kind of uh, sort of took this as their, their responsibility uh, when we started, you know, in the nineties, B tree was the thing. Everyone, everything was B tree, right. Or hash, B tree hash. Uh, but what happens is when you start to need to do things like full text search and GIS, uh, and JSON, B tree and hash are terrible for those where data were, they're terrible. So GIN and GIST and SP GIST are basically specialized indexing that works with this, these types of non-relational uh, data types. And I have a URL there at the bottom that talks about indexing. Uh, Brin, another one, uh, which is for data warehouse. Uh, Breedtree works for data warehouse, but Brin allows you to create very small, very efficient uh, indexes for very large tables. Uh, so again, the concept of extendability of being creating indexes for specific workloads is a key differentiator in Postgres. Full text search, uh, this is also from the Russians, uh, the ability to have a full text search that's built into the database, uh, not a separate uh, piece, uh, but um, sort of part of the relational system, part of the transaction semantics, supporting stemming, supporting different languages. Uh, I have a slide deck here at the bottom that kind of explains some of the feature set here for full text search. Uh, but again, a great differentiator, great innovator for Postgres. Here's an example of a query uh, that uses an index, um, a special index to, to pull out. Uh, I believe in this case is a GIN index, one of those special index types. Uh, Postgres does do a lot of the NoSQL stuff. I mean, they've been talking about NoSQL as something that, um, you know, oh, it's going to replace relational. Well, not really. If you look, if you look at history, uh, we typically have had uh, relational systems have a challenger, like 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 object databases, or uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, there, there's another one, uh, XML databases, which are going to sort of take over. Uh, but effectively, what typically happens is relational finds the value of these new data types, these new data indexes. They bring those capabilities into the relational world, and then they keep going. <laughs> That's why Postgres is still around for long. That's why SQL is still around for long. Uh, but again, in NoSQL, because Postgres has the special data types, it has the special indexing and operators and functions, you can still do very, very efficient NoSQL workloads with Postgres and not lose 
the amazingly powerful relational uh, features. Here's an example of a, of a, a JSON query using, you know, looking at a key. Uh, range types, this is something, again, there's a slide deck down here at the bottom, but this is a great innovator where it takes two uh, timestamps typically or, or two values and it makes a range out of them. So you can do things like start and stop times in a single field. You can use indexing to get overlaps and figure out, you know, to take ranges and kind of combine them together. Instead of doing that all in, in the application code, you can now do sort of range type of calculations in the database a great innovator. It's, it's very often overlooked as a, as a pretty neat capability. And here's an example of a range query. Geometric types, uh, we support all the standard polygon point circle kind of things. Uh, very efficient. We have indexing operators, for indexing for this, uh, specialized indexing. We have nearest neighbor searches, which are pretty cool. So you can find, give me the closest stores to a particular point, for example. Um, and, you know, it's much easier to use than a separate geometric data store. Uh, and finally, GIS, which is sort of a, 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 an offshoot of that uh, geometric type, um, which basically is a full geographic information system developed by a separate team of people. Uh, and it basically just plugs into Postgres as an extension. Uh, really a great, powerful example of innovation happening somewhere else and just sort of laying it right on top of Postgres, giving you a relational plus GIS system. Uh, Postgres is incredibly popular in the GIS space. Here's an example of a GIS query. Foreign data wrappers, if you don't want to put your data all on Postgres, we have over 100 foreign data wrappers, similar to SQL Med. You can basically communicate out to another storage type and bring the data in. Um, here's an example. You can communicate with Oracle or Mongo or Twitter or um, you know, any of these sort of external data stores, uh, you can do your work out there and then just bring the data in to Postgres when you're finished, or you can take the data from Postgres and you can push it out to these, um, to these type of things. So again, you can do a data warehouse in a separate, using a separate piece of software, but to in integrate that in with Postgres when you want to. Uh, here's a data analytics. If you want to do your, all your data processing inside of Postgres, we have all of these capabilities, which are pretty key to doing internal data, uh, data analytics inside of Postgres, again, instead of having to go to something separate. Not that there's something wrong with something separate, sometimes you need that, uh, but in a lot of cases you don't. Um, and Postgres does provide the tools uh, to allow you not to have to go external if you don't, if you don't want to. Uh, here's an example of having a data warehouse maybe on a separate server and using replication to communicate back and forth. Uh, sharding, I think this is an interesting concept. We're releasing Postgres 14 this month or next month, uh, which will have new capabilities in relation to sharding, particularly allowing data warehouses to spread across multiple servers. And I'm excited to see people implement that type of solution now that we've added some, some of this capability in Postgres 14. And here's an example of what the architecture would look like. And finally, the community structure. Uh, it is a very open community structure. Uh, it is a BSD licensed software, which means the software will be available forever, including for proprietary use. So there are a number of companies uh, like my employer EDB, uh, Postgres Pro, uh, SRA OSS, uh, which have proprietary versions of Postgres that they sell. Uh, there are other companies um, that have their have non-proprietary versions that they have open source versions where they just support the community version. So again, you have a, a full spectrum of options there. Uh, the development of leadership is diversified, both geographically, culturally, uh, and it's of course multi-company. Uh, so all of the teams, you know, if you look at the stats, NTT has this people and Crunchy Data has these people and EDB has these people and Postgres Pro has these people and um, you know, all of the kind of groups Fujitsu kind of work together um, to kind of move Postgres forward. And it's a, it's a, it's pretty complicated, but it's pretty interesting. So Postgres still going strong 32 years or, or even more now, uh, 32 years actually of, of development. Um, we've had 22 years of major releases, uh, about 180 features every release. Uh, we do quarterly minor releases and it is the most love relational database, which I think is uh, is pretty cool. So if you're curious about the community itself, uh, there is a website called PG Life. I have the URL there at the bottom. Uh, it gives you an idea of 
most recent email, most recent blog, most recent news item, most recent releases of Postgres, most recent commit. And then at the bottom, we have a copy of the, of the IRC channel. Uh, we also do Slack, uh, but either one, uh, have an idea of like what's going on in the community there. So that does complete my talk. As I promised at the beginning, I was going to give you a different view of open source, a different view of this whole world of proprietary versus open source and why open source is incredibly useful, incredibly good at innovation and also is incredibly good at living for a long time uh, because of the reasons I've, I've, uh, I've given you. So uh, thanks very much. I think we have maybe a little bit of time for questions, Lindsay, or no? We do. We have about five minutes left for questions. <clears throat> Great. Um, I'll say that for the most part, we uh, we really only had commentary in the comments. So um, anybody with questions, feel free to get them in right now. Um, an interesting point that was brought up um, that I think is a good place to start is what happened to the Bell Labs innovation model, the AT and T breakup. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great that's a great question because of course. Unix came out of that environment, right? So the, the Bell Labs, Unix, Murray Hill, kind of New Jersey uh, team. Um, I, I think, and actually I, I can ask, answer this only because I've been around long enough. So in the, in the Bell Labs, Murray Hill kind of environment, they would they create a campus and they hired a whole bunch of people and all the people kind of sat in this big campus. And they worked and they talked and they were super smart people and they collaborated and they had meetings and they sort of planned what they were doing. Okay. And that's not the only case you see RCA doing that. Um, <clears throat> all the big tech companies had these kind of brain trust R and D kind of, kind of, a, of a, um, of a setup. But the reason that those had to be created was because it, communication was so difficult electronic communication that you had to you had to really hire everybody and bring them together in one location okay even something like sending a fax you couldn't do right i mean faxes are from sort of the 80s so if you think back of when bell labs they didn't really have that they they sort of worked effectively on, on ideas around fax or ideas around global communication but it, in terms of practical it really wasn't there so you had to hire everybody and bring them together um what effectively has happened, and, and you see this not only in, in open source, but kind of across the globe, um, is that that development model of hiring everybody and putting all the smart people in a room became very expensive. So you started creating these global teams where you had, okay, I've got some people in California, I got some people in India, I got some people in China, I've got some people, um, you know, maybe in Brazil and Germany, and then they're going to kind of work in this cloud or not cloud, but sort of online environment. And it's much cheaper because I can hire at different salary levels. I can bring people in and out of, of, of my teams because in the Murray Hill model, everybody had to live in Jersey, right? Like everybody had to live within a certain region of, of New Jersey. And if you wanted somebody and they weren't willing to move, you didn't get them. Right. So I think what has happened is that that model was very expensive. But secondly, once global communication, even in terms of phone calls, right? It sounds archaic, but in terms of being able to call people and discuss things became, internationally became much more prevalent. It was much easier to kind of, instead of putting everyone in one place, you now spread that out. What happened with open source is because now you can communicate electronically and send digital data seamlessly globally, then the whole concept, that, that's how open, without the internet, open source wouldn't exist. We'd still be shipping floppies to each other, which is what sort of we used to do, right? Uh, in the eighties, uh, where you'd get, you know, you'd wait for the mail to come and the mail would have a floppy of a new version of the software. Um, so, so once you had global communication, that really opened up open source. And because there's no cost to that, people, in any geogra geography, as long as they have internet access, can participate. And the barrier to entry is so small 
that they can basically just send an email and then they can get involved. And then as they see positive aspects of being involved, they then get more and more involved. So it's sort of like that, that, that cost of entry. If the cost of entry is high, it's very expensive and people don't want to do it. But if the cost of entry is very low, they can get in, they can see what open source is about, they can play with it, they can try it out. And then that's how you basically grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, and that just wasn't possible in the AT&T research model. Great. Uh, we have three more questions. I know we're at the top of the hour. Bruce, do you have time? Yeah, for of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the first of the last three is, who are the competition that Postgres should be aware of? Um, yeah, so I, I've been involved since 96. So I've always kind of looked at where is our competition? Um, you know, how do we differentiate ourselves? I've always been thinking about that growth curve and so forth. Um, you know, back in the early years, uh, it was, you know, it was Oracle, it was Microsoft, it was DB2, it was Sybase. Um, those were the established players in the enterprise. Those were, you know, and then, and then at the open source level, there was MySQL. Um, which kind of have a lot of mind share, although not maybe technically as capable as Postgres, the mind share was, was huge. Uh, but if we fast forward to today, uh, I, you know, I, I can give you some example from, from my own, our own company, EDB, you know, when we started in 2004 and I started in 2006, so I've been with them for what, uh, 15 years. Uh, you know, Oracle compatibility was a huge thing. Like people were like, I want to stay, you know, I, my people know Oracle, Oracle's the standard, you know, I'll use Postgres, but it's ideally I'd like to use Oracle syntax with it and have the same sort of feature set, the same syntax, because I want to always kind of stay close to Oracle. Um, you know, if we look at, at EDB today, uh, you know, there's a huge push to, kind of message ourselves as being not only Oracle compatibility, but just supporting community Postgres, right? So, you know, even though we have an Oracle compatible component to our offering, we see the growth as the community part, right? In, in a lot of ways. And, and that's, that's become truer and truer every year. Every year, I'd say people are less concerned about, I want Oracle syntax and more wanting the Postgres syntax. So I would say in the early years, Postgres was there because it was cheaper and it was open source and it was free and you could like do stuff with it. Um, but it was very niche, right? But if I look now, people want Postgres. They want to standardize on Postgres because they think that's where the growth is. The growth is not in the proprietary database anymore. So if I look at who our competition is in the relational space, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, there really is no, I mean, there's, there's some, there's some forks of Postgres, which, you know, kind of do streaming data or they do, you know, geo distribution or they do, you know, maybe data warehouse better than community Postgres. There's still forks of Postgres and they've got, you know, they've got their place. Uh, but in terms of mainstream relational, I don't know. I, I you know, we used to have, uh, there used to be a, an offshoot of, um, of a Borland database product that, that kind of changed names and it became, um, it became uh, Firebird. And but that, that really, it used to be Interbase, it became Firebird. That hasn't been around for a long time. Uh, there's not a whole lot of other open source things out here. And there's just not a whole lot of non open source database, relational database going, stuff going on. There is a lot of specialized stuff, the Mongos, the Elastic searches and stuff. And they're gonna remain certainly for, um, Cassandra, for, for particularly geographic workloads where you have to do sharding, where, where relational, just the, that centralization of relational doesn't work too well. Again, as I said, we have some sharding stuff, but I don't know. I see a lot of, I see a lot of competitors in the fringes of our workload, but I don't see a whole lot in the relational space. Um, I think because Postgres open source, because it's got such a vibrant community and because of its extendability and because extendability is so hard to bolt on to an existing system, um, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of competition there. Um, and, and a lot of it is competing against ourselves, competing against works of ourselves, um, which, is, you know, which is fine. But again, 
<laughs> we'd probably do what we're doing, whether we were winning or not, you know, we're just, we're just creating databases that people want. And, um, but, but I think, yeah, I think the future is, is really, is really quite bright, but in terms of competition, it's a question of relational. I don't know who that is today. Um, in terms of edge or, or sort of specialized data needs. Yeah. There's a lot of really cool solutions out there, uh, particularly for huge scale. Um, that are still going to be necessary. And, and I think foreign data wrappers uh, addresses that kind of merging of Postgres with those foreign sources pretty well. Lovely. So this next question um, is, any comments on that about the following statement? My problem with open source has been that if things not Postgres broke, there was no help. I don't want to develop the tools. I want to use them comments yeah now that that's that actually gets back to why i joined edb in in 20, 2006 so before edb i worked for uh sra japan so um sra uh is a big integrator in japan and they had a very powerful postgres product and postgres is still hugely popular in japan and what happened was that we were trying to move into new markets and, and new geographies and stuff and the problem was that Postgres was a great database, okay? But it was just a database. And typically when you buy a proprietary database, you get much more than a database. You get the backup, you get the, the monitoring, you get the failover, you get the, you know, you get a full suite of things. And, and the reason I joined EDB is I felt that Postgres was a great database, but it needed that tool set integrated around it because the open source ecosystem at that time around Postgres wasn't big enough to do that. Uh, and Enterprise DB had, had funding so we could fund the development of monitoring tools, fund the development of failover, fund the development of, of, uh, of backup you know, tools and so forth. And, and that was uh, you know, tremendously popular and companies who wanted to use Postgres were, were really happy to do that. We're happy to pay EDB extra money you know, beyond using just free software to have that full suite of tools. In a way, it's the best of both worlds. You've got an innovative core, which is developed by the open source teams, but then you've got sort of the bread and butter, what we call the last mile of service is the way I think of it. Think of a telco. Last mile of service is always the hardest. That bread and butter backup, you know, monitoring, failover support, training, uh, you know, certification kind of thing where companies actually do a better job, okay? So there isn't like for, so I think that's what the, the person is addressing. They're saying, I, I'm happy by, to get a database, but I don't want to be fiddling around with it. I don't want to be responsible for integrating a whole bunch of tools and testing it and make sure they all work. I just want something that works. And when I buy Oracle, or I buy DB2, I buy Microsoft. That's what I get. That's what I want. I want the innovation, but I also want that, that whole ecosystem around it. And EDB has done that. And what you've seen with Postgres Pro and Crunchy and um, and, and and SRA OSS in Japan um, and, and a number of other companies is now developing a better suite of tools around Postgres. Some of them proprietary, some of them are all open source. So for example, for failover, we have a very powerful cool tool called Petroni now, which we didn't have before. Um, it comes out of Zalando in, in, in Germany, but, but it's developed around the world. Um, you know, we've got a very cool, very nice backup tool in PG, PG Backrest, developed by Crunchy Data. That's open source, right? So now, you know, fast forward from 2006 to today, we're now filling in some of the, and these tools have been around for a couple of years, so they're not new. But, but during that span, we filled in that ecosystem of tooling around it. I think you still need support. I think you still need a person to call. You know, honestly, having somebody, databases are very important. The data in there is critical. Paying somebody to verify that your setup is working properly, verify that the failover is going to work properly, verify that your configuration parameters are right, being there when you have a problem. I don't think that's going to go away. I don't think the idea of let's just download all this software and just dump it on a server and run with it for an enterprise is working, is going to work because you have to be, you know, if it's a one, if you're, if you're, if you're installing a one off system, you can do that. But if you're installing hundreds of systems, you need to have that whole ecosystem around you to efficiently deploy that many servers. Mm 
Um, and if you look at the cloud, that's a great example where not only is the database is moving there, but you now have a whole ecosystem of backup and failover and monitoring, right? Which is now developed by the cloud vendor. So that's another case where you're not having to fiddle with a database. You're getting not only a database, but you're getting a whole ecosystem around it. Is that going to cost money? Yes. Is it going to cost money to get support from somebody for a, a non-cloud deployment? Yes. Um, it, do containers make that easier? Yes. Uh, but I think the, 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 the crux of it is that open source is a very evolving system. It doesn't just give you one solution. You know, it, it, you know if you're running Oracle, you're, you're going to have to use their backup tool, right? With, with Postgres, you can use any backup tool, right? You can use any monitoring tool. You can use Grafana or, or Prometheus, right? You can use, um, you know, you can use Barman, you can use PG Backrest. So you've got a whole bunch of choices and typically getting somebody in your organization who will help you work through that process, picking the right tools that meet your needs and making sure that you have a very clean deployment for your, is, is money well spent. Um, so I think that's the answer to that question that, that, yeah, I've talked about free. I talked about how easy it is, um, but ultimately the support and the sort of tooling around that database often requires some expense for the organization if they're deploying at scale. Lovely. And final question before we let you go, Bruce, um, would love to hear opinions on how databases in general are painted now. It seems that many of the quote unquote new developers I interact with never want to database because they believe it's unreliable, old, slow, et cetera. Yet they're quite content building systems that rely on memory caches and non-durable data. Yeah, so I, I guess I have two answers to that. But the first answer is that a lot of people are relearning the things we learned in the 70s and 80s about relational. Um, you know, if I think back to CI SAM, which is, you know, which we used to use for C tree, it was used, used as a, as a sort of, uh, I SAM, um, application language for, for, uh, for data store for applications. Um, there was a huge bunch of complexities around that for an application developer. If you're just doing one thing, it kind of worked, but when you need to take the data and use it somewhere else, or you had problems with crashes, it became this ugly thing that, um, you know, really spend a lot of time kind of clean up. Um, I think there's a definite trend toward more atomic, more siloed application stores. So you write an application, it has, it has its own data store. It may be no SQL. It may be in memory. Um, and then somebody else writes another application and they use their own different, same data store, different data store, but in a different location. And then third person does that. Um, but organizations typically when they do that, um, they find that data governance becomes very hard. And I, I do have a talk about it, although it's not linked to in this slide, but um, what, what's happened, what's happened, it, it's basically called data, data, it's called Data Horizons with Postgres. It's on, it's on my website. Um, and it talks about the fact that in the 70s and 80s, most of your data ingestion was really from a keyboard or punch cards or some kind of terminal and people would type and they type in an order or whatever. Uh, and you fast forward to today, you have GIS data, you've got data from applications, you've got streaming data, you've got internet of things data, you've got data warehouse you've got to do, right? So you have all these new needs for your data. And some people think that relational can't handle that. They can't handle the volume. It's too hard, whatever. Um, but the problem is that you can't, you can get one application up with one specialized data store, but if you need to integrate that with a data warehouse, if you need to worry about data governance, privacy, and, and sort of link that to other data or do analysis on it, um, or even upgrade the application and all of a sudden the data format changes, uh, the long-term life of that application become very complicated. So it's sort of like the opposite, it's sort of like the same $4 chicken to get in, except you can't get out of the supermarket, right? You went to the supermarket to buy four of a chicken. Now you can't get out um, because what happens is a lot of these very simple data stores are very easy to get started. But if something goes wrong, if you have some kind of crash or corruption, or you need to integrate it with something else, you need to do data analysis, or your application needs change, you're kind of stuck. 
And what happens is the first year of the application, everything looks good. But when you think of the, the lifetime of the application, most of the work of the application is not writing the initial version. It's, it's writing the fifth and seventh and 10th version eight years out. And a lot of people are realizing when you're writing, when you're taking a very simple data store and you're trying to keep it alive as data needs change over a long period of time, relational is very good for that. But, but these simpler data stores, although they're very easy to get the initial version going, <clears throat> really struggle as the, as the needs evolve and as the application evolves. Uh, and I think that's something that the industry has to sort of relearn. We kind of learned that when we left that sort of technology in the 70s and 80s, uh, where we could have a relational system that contained data over decades, potentially. Um, and now, because there's so much focus on Agile and just get the application out and don't worry about future versions, don't worry about reliability, don't worry about data governance, don't worry about how we're going to integrate it later, um, a lot of companies are sort of learning, and maybe that's true. Maybe they only need the application for two years and they just shut it off, right? But a lot of data becomes very valuable and has to live for a long time. And it's very hard to do that in, a, in some of these very simple data stores. And I think, I think that's a lesson I've heard from some companies or some of our customers I've talked to are sort of saying we're done with some of these simpler data stores because we can't we can't evolve uh, in a unified way uh, with these data stores, but it takes a while to learn that, um, you know, as a, it, I think the real change is that, is that most applications don't have persistence. Like, you know, most applications, they just start, they do some stuff and they shut and they don't have a long history. And those applications can be generated real quickly because, hey, they only ran. And then if you want to make a new version, you don't have any persistence to it. But anything that has persistence has to have a lot of that relational support around it. Um, and, and I think that's very hard to do in some of these other, other uh, data stores. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. I feel like uh, you really hung on the line with us there. Um, loved the presentation. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for uh, your questions and for your time. So with that, I want to thank you, Bruce. I want to thank our attendees, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.